Hey everyone, I'm Maddie from Maddie Makes and I'm a queer seamstress living in Melbourne. I do lots of sewing and design and I'm working with Campfire Stories to bring you Designer December. I'd probably call myself a designer starting from about two years ago when I stopped sewing like recreationally and started sewing for myself. I have been sewing for the majority of my life since early high school making costumes and I was making lots of clothing to wear to queer parties. It was still very rough around the edges, very much from that like costumey side. It was very much like a slippery slope. I was like, you know, this is great. I can like think of something that I like want that I can't find. I can make it. Part of it was definitely born from the fact that a lot of clothing that I could find in you know shops and thrift stores just you know didn't really seem to fit right. It'd been years since I'd bought anything from like the men's section um, and the stuff that I was getting from like the women's section was like nice but it you know there was something not quite right and being able to design something around your own body around what you want to wear and you know create sort of this self-expression from the ground up that you can put on your body and like show off and express you know yourself in that way it was like really fantastic i think the aesthetic that i was trying to create and the aesthetic that i was sort of um, granted were like two different things the aesthetic that i wanted was like you know fun you know casual cool and the aesthetic i was sort of granted was people thought that a lot of the things I were wearing was stuff that I had bought. This little cape uh, gown number I made for an event called Frocktails a few years ago. So we got this like sleeveless number with like a uh, side tie with a built-in cape. It was an event where people were wearing things that they'd made. It was like, you know, the best opportunity to like show off that side of me. This, this piece especially was really important for helping me sort of come up with my design philosophy because I couldn't use uh, other patterns for like, dresses and gowns because they weren't designed for 
my sort of body shape. I really had to come up with a sort of different idea for designing that was based on like my individual body. So the next piece I want to show off is this very jacket that I'm wearing, um, made from a pink checkered cotton and uh, satin sateen lapels. This was like a really big sort of technical accomplishment for me. There was lots of components that I'd never uh, attempted before and I was really sort of trying to build up my repertoire. So my, my process is nearly exactly the same for every garment that I make. Um, it normally involves doing a bit of soul searching, seeing what I really like, you know, what am I feeling at the moment? Then I normally go out, I do a couple of little sketches, uh, just in like grey lead pencil, and then go fabric shopping, which is normally where I've like started to solidify the idea. Uh, purchase the fabric and then I make reference pictures. So for this one particularly, I made two watercolor paints um, to really get an idea of how you know it would come together in the end and do some like adjustments. I use those references to come up with a pattern, which I use from uh, my own measurements. Um, I then cut out all of that pattern into calico or paper and use that onto the fabric. Um, and I start constructing. And because I'm, you know, making everything from start to finish using my own measurements, it normally comes out fitting like exactly the way I planned. And in the end, I can put it on and wear it. That's the final step. <laughs> Sewing and fashion has very much been interlinked with gender identity and sense of self. For the majority of people who are uh, trans and gender diverse, you know, outward expression and how the world is like interpreting you is, you know, really important for your mental health, for the way that you, you know, go about your day. So being able to make something that you feel as comfortable in as your own skin is like really, really important for my gender journey. About to leave, already packing. Come with me, I'm not really asking. We'll get away to a place where we don't know. About to see the world in action. What we can be, life with no distractions. We'll get away, this is what we waited for.
Hi, my name's Andy. Um, I'm non-binary. My pronouns are they, them. I'm the founding director of Amore Design Studio and um, the brands Amore Binders, which I'm going to be talking a little bit about today. I make chess binders for trans and gender diverse people and the queer community as well, because, you know, everyone can wear a binder if they really want to. My design philosophy is to design clothing that celebrates and affirms queer and trans identities, enhances body confidence and facilitates fun. I've been wearing binders myself for over six years now. When I first started wearing them, I tried like lots of people do, lots of different binders, couldn't really find any that kind of were uh, that great and so decided at one point, well, how I'm going to design my own. One of the first things I suppose in making them more comfortable was taking away some of the things that make them uncomfortable, such as, you know, seams that dig in and um, scratchy, itchy labels and tags and fabric that just doesn't feel nice. I've made a point of sourcing fabric that is um, as sustainable as possible. And so, for instance, the um, lacquer that I use for my binders is made from um, recycled nylon. This is the fabric I have to select for, but uh, I can't stock every single one of those colors. I know color is something that's kind of a big part of who I am and my brand and why people love the things that I do and make. When I first started this out, um, I had no money. I was completely broke and trying to save for medical expenses. And um, I got these big bags of all these lacquer offcuts from this amazing company. And so I had lots of all these like little pieces of this colorful lacquer. And so I wanted to kind of just utilize that. So I just started making things for myself first and then other people and then went, wow, like there's lots of people really interested in what I'm doing. I finally got um, my patterns professionally made with some pattern makers I've been working with and had them sent to a manufacturer in Melbourne, was going to get my first samples made and um, you know, literally that week I was meant to get my samples back from them and I was like, yes, things are like, you know, moving forward and it's great. And then stage four restrictions were announced. The manufacturer um, in Melbourne was going to be closing their doors in a matter of only three days, I think it was. I um, had to make some decisions really quickly and decided to get my patterns and my fabric back. And um, I was like, wow, I'm just, what am I going to do? Like, it's going to be at least probably another six months before I can get these samples made. And I decided, well, you know what, how I'm, I'm going to do it myself. Just decided that week I'm going to start a GoFundMe and try and raise some of the money I need to get the manufacturing equipment. So I did manage to raise quite a bit of money and I've almost reached my goal now, which is amazing. This person, um, lovely guy called Ryan, he had all this equipment and wanted to sell it as like a bulk lot rather than sell things off in dribs and drabs. And so he literally had everything that I needed to, um, you know, do my own manufacturing. Things couldn't have like got, gone better than that. I'm um, doing a Midsummer Pathways program and we're, I just happened to be looking for a mentor for that and they were struggling to find someone with the expertise um, needed to help me with the things that I needed. This, this person um, is now my mentor um, through Midsummer Pathways as well and he's teaching your machinery skills how to use all this stuff because um, I would have been learning all of that at my, at my college um, if it weren't for coronavirus. When I want to do something, I just don't stop until I do the thing. <laughs> and that's just how I am. It's my nature, it's my neurodivergence. One of the values of my brand, like core value of my brand is um, accessibility and inclusivity. Being part of a marginalized group, I think it's really, really important to have those values. I'm still developing some designs that I'm not quite ready to launch yet that are going to be a bit more accessible for people with um, like disabilities that um, impact mobility. But um, to begin with, um, 
you know, I have my sensory friendly binder, which is one I've been developing all this time. I want my brand to be successful and success, I guess, is, I mean, it all starts with having a good product. And I'm pretty confident that when I launch, you know, I'm going to have an amazing product because I've been developing it for so long and working so hard to make it.
I want to acknowledge that we're joining you here from um, the lands of the Wurundjeri people, the Kulin Nation, um, and we're living on unceded land um, and sovereignty was never ceded. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging um, and pay my respects to them um, and to any Indigenous people who might be watching this from um, all lands across so-called Australia um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the lands that this broadcast will be reaching. Hello, my name's Casper. Um, my pronouns are they, them. I am Gujjamara and non-binary and um, very queer and half of Aeon and Fern. My name's Sersha. I'm the other half of Aeon and Fern. My pronouns are she or they. I'm a non-binary Kuri person and together we make wearable artworks um, in gold, silver and base metals. I started out doing um, metalwork as kind of a, a hobby. I just enrolled in a short course at Melbourne Polytech and on day one I was like, I love this. This is, this is it. This is what I want to do. It was kind of all happening just as we were getting to know each other and um, as our relationship like developed and became more serious they started to become more interested in what it was that I was always doing. It's so infectious when someone really loves what they're doing and um, the, the passion um, you get from it. The base materials we work with is mostly silver um, and, and gold, but we also work with copper and brass and bronze. We get some of that from um, a ethical refinery and it kind of comes in sheets or wires, but um, we also recycle our own old jewellery that people don't want anymore and so we have the ability to melt that down um, and hammer it out absolutely from scratch and that's a really rewarding process. Everything we use has had a history and when we're making things in precious metals they're going to last hundreds of years mm -hmm. um, and even if that means that somebody melts it down and makes it into something else it still has that history in it and it feels like a really wonderful connection to the earth and to mm. and to the people who have all worked in shaping it and it will always shift and change because as you wear a ring it will mold to the shape of the hand and be more like you mm. we don't try and make these perfect calibrated pieces that you would find mm -hmm. in a high-end boutique you know mm. we're making things that are unique and every single one of them is is one of a kind the polishing tools are like using the most and they're round they make a really beautiful texture that makes everything really wavy and i resonate with it a lot more in terms of being connected to um, nature and where i live there's all this generational jewelry that um, people get from their families and to be able to change that from it being all these such heteronormative couples wedding old wedding rings but to make it um, the way to pass down queer stories or pass down the stories of people of colour who have otherwise not been able to pass down the stories anymore. Earlier in transition for me, like having um, more kind of feminine coded rings was such a, a lovely way to feel um, really euphoric in, in my gender mm -hmm. presentation and um, making that accessible to other people is really important and part of that is keeping the price accessible to those communities um, and the other thing is having inclusive sizing everything is gender neutral and anyone can wear it um, but if we're making something that is more typically seen as masculine we make sure to include smaller sizes in that and if we're making things more typically seen as feminine we make sure to include bigger sizes in that and that really makes a difference when it comes to being accessible to trans people I want to be able to help create safe spaces for people, helping them get out of the house that morning because they're wearing their armour in their earrings and their rings. To me, jewellery is a way of decorating your body in a way that, that makes that possible. I love tattoos and I have lots of tattoos as well, um, but jewellery is something that you can put on and off depending on, on the feeling that you're going for or, you know, that sense of what kind of armor you need to wear today. I'm just thinking about how so many um, pieces of history from country have been lost because 
how colonised and not seeing the value in it. Mm. I guess this um, the method of making precious metal jewellery from the perspective of an uh, indigenous voice. It kind of um, puts them in the spot because it's something they value, but it's like, but they don't want to, but they're also, no, this isn't from a white person, what do we do? We're really excited to both be working on um, this project for the Anti-Racist Arts Collective as a, a way of further increasing that community engagement. Um, we are hosting and teaching um, silversmithing workshops. You can find us on Facebook um, at the Anti-Racist Arts Collective. We also have an email at an antiracistarts at peersupport.org.au. Hello, all you beautiful people. I'm Catherine from Gunshy, and I'm an artist and fashion designer, and I make faux fur jackets. Technically, it's a fashion business, but actually, it's it's basically my artistic practice. It's high end and it's luxury. Everything's handmade because I love the process of making it. Basically every coat I make is a custom coat. So I'm taking measurements and I'm working with the customer to evolve their jacket. I try to make stuff that's gonna sell but still artistic as well. So, and beautiful and pushes my limits. Um, I try to push myself every time with my design. It can take kind of up to two weeks um, to do a full-on custom tailored 
piece by the time I've done the pattern making. Then I've got to cut the fur and cutting fur. You can't just cut fur. So basically once I've put marked out all the pattern and stuff, it's a really slow process to cut the fur so that you don't cut the pile. Um, so that in itself also takes ages and then sewing, also the sewing of the fur takes ages because you have to put the, the fur in a particular way and pin it in, um, so that the fur's out. It's, it's all very slow. With the fur, you can't iron anything because it'll burn it. So the jackets, uh, when I've sewn them, um, I, I have to hand sew. I've completely changed the rules of pattern making to adapt to making faux fur jackets as well. So initially I was scared to break the rules, um, but then I was just like, no, that's it just, those rules aren't working. I think it is important that I was a working class kid that grew up in St. Auburn. I did gymnastics at a high level and diving at a high level. I was Australian champion in both sports and had an AIS scholarship. I was a stunt woman for a year. Then I did a university degree in Eastern philosophy and Aboriginal religion and anthropology. Traveled to India, went, I can't do this. I want to be an artist and travel the world. Met somebody, said they were in this amazing company called Strange Fruit. Yeah, got into this fucking international company after a party. Anyway, it was wild. And then got to travel the world with Strange Fruit, which was just extraordinary. When I was in Berlin, I was still in Strange Fruit, just doing little bits of tours here and there. And I had money saved up, but I ran out of money and I'd done a little pattern making course and I sewed up a whole lot of stuff and um, on just a sewing machine, went to the market and sold out of, literally sold out of what I'd made and realized I could stay in Berlin by making clothes. I got a little, I had a little studio shop front and I sewed clothes and, um, started a little fashion label in Berlin, completely just self-taught, just doing crazy stuff. Went to RMIT, did the fashion course at RMIT, and then when I finished, yeah, I started, I pretty much just thought, oh, I'm just gonna start. I think at the start, you gotta, you gotta work, you gotta work hard. Like, um, it's an industry where you gotta work. So that's not like, what I've realized this year, it's, that's not about slogging, but it's about focusing and learning as much as you possibly can. When you're going to do something, you commit to it and you, you do it properly. Learn the skills, learn how to pattern make, learn about fabrics. And it should be a joy to do those things. If, you, if that's not a joy, then you're in the wrong industry. For the last few years, I've made a big collection every year and then I do a full-on show for that collection every year but that's because I also because my background's in theatre um, I basically burnt out at the end of last year um, so it was sort of perfect timing what unfolded this year with COVID hitting closed my studio and I moved my studio home with that I decided to yeah I'm not really going to be making collections anymore people have still been contacting me and I've just done custom jackets for people all year I don't want to run the business in terms of how the fashion industry works because it's it's not a healthy industry. It sits better with me just in terms of my sustainable and ethical ideals that I have with Gunshy as well. And part of that is looking after yourself and not working yourself into the ground and having strong boundaries. If you're going towards something and it's not feeling right, it's making you feel like shit, you know, like I can stop it. That's my advice too. Like don't don't go down paths and don't do things that don't that that aren't making you feel good or fueling you.
face on the edge We fight and make love at the same time Would you break up just because I told you What I did last night I recall the times you said you're sorry But still I'm not sure if you told lies Melbourne-based burlesque performer slash dancer slash other things and I am 50% of the brand now serving snacks. Hi, my name is Ruby Slippers. I'm a Melbourne-based drag, burlesque performer and costumer and I am 50% of now serving snacks. We specialize in vibrant colors, bold designs and inclusivity is at the heart of each snack. Four sluts, buy sluts. Currently a non-practicing slut though. <laughs> 
So the journey begins in 2015. I started burlesque in 2015 and entered and won the competition of Mr. Boylesque Australia. And since then I've been doing little bits of my own acts and my own works um, as a burlesque performer and from there I kind of taught myself sewing because I wanted to be able to make my own specific costumes or attach parts to costumes or tear away things or tear away g-strings as you do. My background in sewing begins literally is, is I think it's my earliest memory is trying to make a big poofy chul skirt for myself uh, out of some fabric that I found so I have been playing dress ups and costuming for as long as I can remember. Uh, I got into burlesque in 2011 and I competed in the Miss Burlesque uh, WA and Australia competitions which is how I met Mr Eggs and Ham uh, and when we found out that we happened to get along pretty well as people and both really liked making stretchy slutty g-strings and costumes it just meant that we could do my two favorite things work and have friendship uh, <laughs> at the same time uh, so i guess that's how we, we came together my background in costuming for film and tv and advertising and burlesque performers and drag artists i was able to bring that knowledge into the patterning and the designing uh, and able to use the existing networks that I had and that Ham also had to start building our clientele, to start getting feedback on the products that we were creating and to find out what kind of gaps there were in the market. And it turns out the gaps were shaped like hot pink sparkly G-strings. A lot of my work is working as a male dancer and being a backup dancer and that kind of thing. And the, there's been a lot of times when there's um, backup dancing for this stunning queen or this stunning singer and then you just kind of get handed a pair of black speedos to wear next to them and that wasn't really my vibe as maybe you can probably tell the inspiration comes from what wasn't there and what wasn't available so hopefully uh, we've started to achieve that and hopefully we continue achieving that with our store and our brand. Our design process from the get-go was ensuring that our styles were available to people of um, varying genitalia who might like to wear them in a variety of ways. That 100% reflects our, our friendship group and our community. So it was literally something that we started doing from the start, making sure that we had pouch front and flat front options for all of our briefs so that you could do whatever the hell you want to do with your junk. As long as you want your butt to hang out, we're all about butts. <laughs> it's just made for the person. It's not about, um, yeah, anything else. We've been incredibly lucky to be embraced by uh, the queer community, the burlesque community, um, who are, that's us, that's our people, that's where we come from. Am I modeling anything from now serving snacks tonight? You ask. Uh, I am wearing the figure eight harness in leopard print with a sleeveless turtleneck crop. Ham, what are you wearing? What am I wearing? Oh, catch my good angles. We've got my cropped raglan with the blue fog and on the bottoms we've got our running shorts as well and you can see the faint outline of a blue quarantini hanging out in there as well these are all things that you can order and you can have in the store we just make um, exactly what we would make the customer is the stuff that we're wearing uh, navigating our store as separate but together entities during lockdown has been Totally a challenge. It's just been a lot of shouting measurements over Zoom. Go one centimetre up and then eight centimetres across. Look, it's been a real difficult year for setting goals and knowing what on earth is going to happen. Uh, but we would love to be able to continue making things that make people happy to perhaps get some industrial machines so we can produce things at a higher quality, at a faster rate. Um, so we can fulfill more people's needs. I was watching the Versace show, so hopefully I get big enough that I get to have my own magazine and get assassinated in my front yard. I think that's the goal. To be big enough to get assassinated would be really cool. <laughs>
this Friday night How I'm longing for this day Yes, I'm single, oh, we want to mingle And my friends are on the way You got that good, good vibe I want to spend some time back here with you Lakesh Kashyap, I am a lawyer, a human rights lawyer. Fashion was never an option. It was either medicine or law or accountancy or engineering. So I went down the traditional pathway and I, and I absolutely loved it. I'd done quite a lot of work and I was itching to do something creative. So I decided to take a break um, and study fashion. But before that, I had no sewing skills. My love for fashion was basically, it started when I was in India. I remember dad was heavily responsible for curating my mom's wardrobe and my mom loved it because she didn't have to do anything and she would end up with these beautiful, magnificent pieces that everyone would comment on. Right, and so dad used to pick up fabrics, he used to pick up trims, he used to pick up buttons and he used to give the tailors the directions as to how many panels they need to be, how the panels are going to run, like every single detail and I used to accompany him to these trips to tailors um, and I guess my fascination just started there. Like the way I consumed fashion was visually, so my knowledge of sewing and machine work was, was zero basically before I started this and everything that I've learned I've learned over the last two years at uni. Every trimester we were given a brief and we had to make our own interpretation of that brief. So for the first trimester, the brief that we got was we have to make a skirt which has to have some sort of folds. Um, and I made a skirt that was inspired by the Indian sari and Indi Indian dhoti. So sari is traditionally worn by women and dhotis are traditionally worn by men. And I wanted to incorporate both masculine and feminine features of the respective garments. It's always been um, the brief that I was given um, and then my aesthetic was mostly cultural and just OTT. And that's something that my fashion school has really struggled with because for them stuff that makes money is basically what is in Paris, in, on the runways in Paris and Milan. They teach us that you need to define your target demographic, right? Because ultimately when you make your brand, you'll be focusing towards a certain section of people. And to them, me limiting myself to South Asian community and South Asian diaspora doesn't make sense because they haven't done their research in terms of how much fashion means to this diaspora and how much they're willing to spend in fashion and what it culturally means or what it emotionally means and that has been a bit disappointing. I came up to my dad and he doesn't understand it 
and he's one of those people who is really extremely nice right and extremely polite and doesn't judge people but he's still struggling to accept that his son is gay or bisexual or is going through a process of discovering himself and that does not align with what he grew up with or what he was taught or what he saw so i feel like there's a lot of unpicking and unlearning that he has to do and i can't force that it's been quite hard because this is something that i'm doing and i'm quite proud right but i at the same time i can't share this with him right i can't message him hey this is what i made look at this um i can't explain the concept to him because he's not to me he's not ready a lot of south asian people would not be able to have this conversation without having the fear of being kicked out or having the fear of something worse happening to them um and i and i cherish the fact that i'm so privileged but i don't take it for granted for the graduate collection i really wanted to focus on paying your homage to my culture and indian roots south asian queer communities and queer people and how most of us have not been able to find the acceptance in the family and we find family outside of family so i have three pieces in my collection um the first one is a skirt and a blouse with a headpiece that i designed and created with a local jewelry store i wanted to keep that look quite contemporary and where i introduced my culture was um the headpiece there's a lot of beaded work with a lot of thread work the second look i thought about okay so what would a modern south asian woman want to wear just like something that's fun and light and airy so i made pants um from this indian fabric and then i paired it with a blouse um in the checked fabric uh with voluminous sleeves and then i have a ruffle quilted belt on it just across the chest and for the third look which is this one behind me i wanted to make a contemporary robe like a like a royal cloak even and this is where i was like this has to be like the piece and so i'm getting an indian drag queen to um model this look and so this collection is about about us basically being like we know we are out there and we need to stand together and we are not alone Oh, yeah. 
gender. If he was ours the same, so let's wear together. Pushing through the storm, we take storm the weather. This unity upon us shall last on forever. They tell me that black lives matter, but my life do it matter. So tell me what really matters. Rico, my straight sisters gotta die so you can be a man. Look around, hurt your pride, life in your head. Tell them now, did that really make you more of a man? Why be watching every day? Man, we ain't no fam. I live the war every day, trenches in these streets. My sister dying, yeah, you know this can never be. Tony McDaniel. Yeah, the spill, Nina Pop, Shine Roll, and Nigel Jones, this shit needs to stop. Taking the love in the game, yeah, being gay. Never stood on the corner, hell, push away. But I know how it is to fight every day. If my life don't mean shit, I'll be okay. Just speaking on the truth, dead or no lie. You be hiding from these niggas, yeah, all night. We gon' stand up for the truth, everybody. I'ma tell you right now, I'ma flip for everybody. Somebody get there.